Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Hardware Podcast. My name is Jackson Danner alongside uh, Omar Borja, who's on his 60 day vacation. Must be nice. Um, and uh, you thought we were done with FCS spring football. We are not. We are right back at it, going over and reviewing uh, Phil, Phil Steele's. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of him. Phil Steele's uh, 2021 FCS All American team. So he did a first, second, and third team. Uh, for each position. And uh, we're just kind of going to be doing a little deep dive into that today. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, we have three teams for the players and we're not going to hit everyone, of course, that would take forever, but we'll just hit some of the guys that really wowed us and some of the more interesting discussion pieces. And it has indeed been a while and we're not going to go away from talking about the FCS for sure. I mean, in the fall of the hardware pod, we'll cover the FCS award races to some degree, along with, you know, the Heisman and other positional award races. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the Buck Buchanan and Walter Payton awards aren't going anywhere. We're going to, we're going to be covering those as well. And um, full blown warning, just because we disagree with a lot of Phil Steele's uh, picks does not mean we could do a better one. I just want to make that clear because I don't think I could do a better job, but I definitely disagree with some of this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've been a I've been a loyal Phil loyal Phil Steele reader for the last twelve years since two thousand nine, and have a lot of respect for him. But it's all about discussion. I mean, that that's that's the great deal about America. It's all about discussion and free speech. So, was there like a like a four year gap between when you first started reading and then first started reading Phil Steele? I'm trying to do the math in my head. If you've been reading Phil Steele for twelve years. That's impressive because, I mean, you're not in kindergarten. You're not going to be able to read, you know, you can read some, but not not Phil Still levels. So that man, pretty much as soon as you started reading, I guess. That's impressive. Yeah, I mean, I, I always bought the Athlon magazines too, but the yeah. about Phil uh, Steele, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Phil Steele. I guess those just... were Phil Still, so I guess I've been reading off and on for that long. Uh, let's see. So let's, let's dive in right into the quarterbacks. Um, do you agree with having the Walter Payton award, AKA the best offensive player as the th- not first or second team, but third team quarterback? <laughs> so in an odd way, yes. And I'll give a reason for each quarterback. Um, so barrier will barrier balled out out in the big sky. And the only reason people weren't talking about it more is because uh, one, they're on the West Coast, and two, their TV contract, their national TV contract was with Pluto, was with Pluto TV, which a great idea in con- in concept, free uh, free streaming, but a lot of schools just didn't have the production equipment to make good productions, and it just wasn't as accessible as other, uh, or, or well known as other streamers like ESPN Plus. So Barrier balled out, and it also feels like a career achievement type thing, because he's been doing this for a few years now, so it only feels right to make him first team All-American. I mean, If you think about 2019, he was robbed by Trey Lance, you know, Uh, not really robbed, but Trey Lance uh, got the better of him on the All-American teams. So it just feels right to make Barrier the All-American this year. Second team, Schmid. Uh, I agree with that as well. A winner. And he had had some great statistical games, too, as we talked about earlier in the season. And that also brings up, I think, I'll I'll answer your question with another question is like, like, why why wasn't Eric Schmid a Walter Payton finalist? That's something that, that really puzzles me. And he played like... He, you know, he was angry about that in the playoffs. Now, Cole Kelly, third team, put up amazing stats, tremendous stats. Um, and I, I think Phil Steele looks at the head-to-head and with uh, Sam Houston in the Southland, how uh, Southeastern Louisiana did not make the playoffs. They probably would have made the playoffs had they beaten Southern Illinois, but Southern Illinois got the better of them. So, I mean, I, I can see where it happens, and I know it sounds strange, but I, I agree, honestly, because I'm sure there's other years where the highs where the highs there's years where the Heisman winner doesn't make first team All American. Like, uh, I know you're going to see when I mentioned his name, but Eric Crouch in 2001, I don't think an option quarterback made first team All American. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I can definitely see that. I mean, Colt Kelly, all of these guys had great seasons. I'm not trying to dish men or barrier or anything. Um, but it's it's just interesting to me that Cole Kelly is the third team. When we walked away after our conclusion of the Walter Payton work, we walked away like, yeah, Cole Kelly seemed like the right winner, you know. And now that he actually won it, I think we can kind of see that. But um, Eric Schmidt, um, if Eric Schmidt doesn't win the whole thing, do you think Cole Kelly maybe takes second team instead? Or do you think Schmidt just being a winner – 
kind of kind of seals that. I think. Uh, I mean, I guess it depends, like, wh- when Schmid gets booted. Because, I mean, Kelly, if you look at the last game they played, like, Schmid played the last game in the FCS. Cole Kelly hadn't played since April 17th. So maybe recency, I wouldn't say bias, but recency was a factor in it, along with winning. So I would, yeah, I, would, I, yeah. I, I guess I, I'd say yes, given to the head to head. Because Schmid, like, the, I mean, his stats weren't great, but he had moments of brilliance in, like, the regular season where he had, like, Cole Kelly like games. Uh, I think against like, especially against Nickel State um, earlier in the year. So I, I'd say yes. Yeah. Okay. That that's fair. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. I think it'd be barrier Kelly Schmidt if Schmidt doesn't end up winning at all. Um, moving on to our running backs, I think we both have something to say on this one. Pierre Strong is Phil Steele's uh, the running back out of uh, South Dakota State. Uh, is the first on the first running back on the first team. Um, I don't think he's even the best on the team. I think you have to give that to Isaiah Davis, who I don't know how he didn't make in the top 10. Uh, Isaiah, just for, just for some context, Isaiah Davis, also from South Dakota state, he was second in the entire FCS in rushing. Uh, He was one of two that had over 800 yards 10 touchdowns at eight and a half yard average at 823 yards compared to Pierre Strong, who Phil still listed three touchdowns, a 5.4 yard average, 731 yards. I just, I, I, at first I thought it was maybe a misprint. Like, I don't, uh, what do you think on that? Do you think Pierre Strong is a better back than Dave? On, I'd say they're about the state. They're about the same level. And um, looking at the title game, I think they do different things very well. Like Isaiah Davis, uh, I mean, he was like a bowling ball, hard to tackle um, just from watching South Dakota State. But I think what it was was simply the fact that Isaiah Davis was a freshman this year, I believe. I think I think it was a freshman, right? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah I, uh, I believe so. Although uh, uh, Phil Steele's uh, freshman of the year went to his teammate, Mark Granowski, which is hard to argue against that. But yeah. Um, just struck me odd that he couldn't even make a third team second back or anything. Cause I, I think, I, I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. I, I love Pierre strong and they have a great one, two punch uh, for the Jack rabbits, but it just, it struck me very odd. Um, although he got it perfectly right with Julius chestnut, the uh, running back out of sacred heart. We're big chestnut fans. Uh, maybe I think he was the best running back. Uh, and he also led the nation in all purpose yard. He got involved in the passing game, so Chestnut was great. Uh, Otis Weah, another guy we're a big fan of, he came in on the second team, running back out of North Dakota. We still have point to that game versus NDSU. Or maybe they would have hung around for a little bit longer if they have kept in on the ball to Weah. Uh, what, what do you have to say as far as the uh, the remaining of the, the second and third teams? Uh, honestly, I, I like it. I like the diversity in terms of conferences that Phil Steele did with, the, with these teams. Uh, especially like guys like um, Dijon Lee from Delaware, uh, Percy, AJ Obes out of, uh, I'm, I'm sure I butchered that, out of James Madison, and especially Juwan Ferry. Juwan Ferry had an amazing year for Monmouth, but people just weren't really aware because Monmouth had played so few games. Um, I mean, they absolutely ripped um, Kennesaw State, the, the power of, out of the Big South. So I really like the diversity and Ferry too. Uh, I'm going to pull up his stats really quick, but Ferry had an amazing rate. Like, and keep in mind that these, uh, you know, these stats, these average stats are kind of inflated given the short samples that they had, but in four right. games, Ferry had an insane, really. I mean, 104, 104 attempts, 520 yards and 10 touchdowns. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, so a five yard average. And then um, had, had a few receiving yards, yeah. too, nothing too much to note. Uh, but, yeah, he, he definitely had a great season. Had uh, almost half the yards that he did in his last season, 2018, but four touchdowns, too, you should know. So, um, yeah, Juwan Ferry had a, had a good year, but you're right. We, we I know we didn't talk about him much. No. Uh, probably went a little bit unnoticed, but, yeah. Um, so do you think Phil still got it, got it right on this one? Is there anything you would add in? Um, obviously I've said Isaiah Davis already. Anyone you would add in someone that maybe you would take out if you could, do you think the, we've talked about the JMU brand name bias. Do you think maybe Percy, uh, 
Aggie IO Beats is uh, going in there. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a hard name, but I mean, I think I think they have it right in terms of that because he was, you know, the workhorse for that team. And they did show out in the playoffs for sure. Uh, he did end up with 717 yards in seven games, over 100 yards per game. And they did play elite competition in the playoffs. They played the eventual national champion winners. They played a tough VMI defense that we had touted all, all season long. And I mean, who else do they play? Um, yeah, I, I think I think that's uh, that's it, really. But yeah, uh, I, I think I don't think there's much bias there, really, in terms of James Madison. And you know, same thing later on with Mike Green, which I'm sure we'll we'll talk about later on. Moving on to the receivers, um, I know we're both big fans of Jacob Harris, and I'm, I think we're very glad that he got a first receiver on the first team. Uh, yeah, there are a bunch of names of, of guys that we've at least mentioned a couple times. Tyler Hudson, Avante Cox from Southern Illinois. Um, there was one guy that I kind of got gypped a little bit, uh, Xavier Gibson out of Stephen F. Austin. Uh, he had 10 games played, 52 receptions, 847 yards, and nine touchdowns. All better stats than Tyler Hudson didn't even crack the top eight. Uh, you have any uh, any notes or top top nine, I believe. You have any uh, any other guys that you think maybe did didn't make it or should have made? It? Um, no, I think this is a solid list, and there's some guys we didn't talk about as well. Uh, so just D'Angelo D'Angelo Wilson out of Austin P. And uh, you know, I, I think the Ohio Valley Conference kind of got a little bit on um, you know overshadowed by all the other conferences because they played a lot of their games on Sundays but D'Angelo Wilson over 600 yards receiving and I mean 45 catches great receiver uh same thing with I love this name uh Talolo Limu Jones especially uh, my favorite commercial is Limu Emu and Doug for Liberty Mutual <laughs> um so you know I, I gotta I gotta love uh Talolo Limu Jones who had over 700 yards receiving and I think a guy that kind of snuck in here um Abdul Fatai Ibrahim who only played three games, interestingly enough, but had 277 receiving yards in those three games and was just absolutely, like, amazing in that high-powered Alabama A&M offense. And I, I think Alabama A&M is a celebration bowl. It was a swag favorite. They should be able – I think they might be able to knock off Alcorn State um, this, this fall. Uh, and then as well, too, I like a guy like Avante Cox who really did a lot of other stuff other than receiving. Had over 200 yards receiving on over 20 carries, too. So, I mean, and we'll see later on that Southern Illinois had a lot of, had a lot of guys doing a lot of different things um, on their offense. So um, that, that's my sense. Also too, uh, we didn't really talk about Jaquez Ezzard. I think Jaquez Ezzard, Jax, I got to ask, do you think that he is a Walter Payton, I guess, you know, front runner in the fall because with his championship performance and with the, the way that he does everything for that offense, I think he might have um, a, a real good case in the fall. With the championship performance, if the Walter Payton Award was done after that, I think he has a strong case because he, uh, if, if you watched any highlights of that game, he he popped out on the screen pretty quickly. Um, you you could see him, uh, and you know he definitely it didn't hurt that he had you know Eric Schmidt at quarterback too, who was throwing dimes to him all year. But um, I mean, he definitely has a case, and if anything, second team is low. Um, you could you could definitely make the argument to put him a little bit higher. Um, as far as rounding back to Abdul Fatai Abraham, am I, did I say that right? Even close? Probably not. Okay. I think it's Ibrahim. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, yeah. oh, you, you'll know who we're talking about if you've got the list in front of you. Um, not dissing him at all. He had a great season with Alabama a and Any guy that only has one more uh, touchdown than tackles for the year. He had three touchdowns, two tackles. Don't know if you deserve uh, to be on the top top nine receiving list, especially when there is a guy like Xavier Gibson <laughs> um, still available on that list who is leading pretty much like every category on that. Um, one more game to play, but he, he had a great year. Um, quick little pop quiz for you. Do you know who led the nation in uh, receiving touchdowns among receivers this year? It was double digits. None of these guys we've talked about had double digits. It wasn't Harris. Harris didn't have double digit touchdowns. Um, I've got well, oh. or did he not lead? I thought he led the nation. He had in eight games, played eight touchdowns. Oh, geez. Okay. I, I, then I'm I'm drawing a blank. Was it a tight end? 
I don't believe so. No, hey, oh, I don't. I don't. I'm drawing a blank. Luhan Winningham, nine games played, twelve touchdowns. Oh, and okay. Wow. I forgot to write down his school, which is kind of embarrassing. But like, actually, I do have one um, snub. I think I think this guy's a snub for sure. Uh, out of Delaware State, Trey Gross. And anyone that watched Delaware State's games on, you know, tape delay, because they were they were tape delay kings. Um, a couple of their games were got the got the morning slot, the Sunday morning uh, rerun slot on ESPNU. And I got to say that uh, I did watch a couple, but Trey Gross, absolute big play threat, jump ball threat, 6'4", 210, 248, 17 catches, 248 yards, but five touchdowns, including a monster stretch against uh, – against Howard and South Carolina State where he had five catches, 175 yards, and five touchdowns. Um, absolutely amazing. And I thought that maybe if you're going to include um, a, a receiver who played less games, maybe you go with Gross instead of, um, you know, Fatir Fat- Fat- Ibrahim. Um, but that's just that's just my opinion. I, th- I think Gross really deserved it too. Uh, Luhan Winningham went to Central Arkansas, and I got that stat from the NCAA website, but the Central Arkansas site does not show that he even played in the 2020 season, so I don't know if that was a mishap on the uh, NCAA's website. Wouldn't be the first mistake they made. So, (laughs) um, now we we can go ahead and move on to tight ends. Um, what do you think about uh, who they got? Trey Berry, Brian Miller, Rodney Williams. Um, any guys you think they missed? Any guys you think they should have added in there? Um, I thought they had it pretty solid. Uh, just a bunch yeah. of great um, red zone threats, especially um, especially a Rodney Williams. I think Rodney Williams, I think, was a huge red zone threat for UT Martin. And, of course, overshadowed a bit by UT Martin's lack of success. But really – I mean, I don't think you can go wrong with any any of these guys. I, I do want to ask: Are, are we going to talk about the fullbacks? Because, I mean, I thought it was um, I thought it was awesome that Phil Seal had a had a you know a, a slot for fullbacks on his team. Yeah, and does he though? If it weren't for Hunter Lupka, like he just dominated. I mean, he made a name for fullbacks <laughs> in general. Just made you appreciate. I, I remember he had his first game back was against North Dakota, and he had a couple huge plays in that one. Uh, he was like one inch away from like a 70 yard touchdown. I mean, it got put like, right. It was almost touching the goal line right there. I think, it, I think it got called back actually. It was, it was very close. Um, one guy, as far as that, um, that uh, I think he might've missed in my opinion was a Hayden Hatton. Uh, he's a, a tight end. And he had 518 yards this year and only five games split, which is double what Ryan Miller out of Furman had on his second team. Uh, something that that I thought was was interesting, at least. He only had two touchdowns, but five games played, 34 receptions, 518 yards for the year. Yeah, I mean, if you go, if you go with yards, um, then that that's true. But again, like Miller, just being a red zone threat, he only had 15 catches, but six of them went for touchdowns. So it was yeah. like in the SoCon, you knew where the ball was going in the red zone, but could you stop it? You, you know. So I think yeah. I think it's perfectly served putting uh, Ryan Miller in second team. Oh, I, I mean, I would agree with that. If anything, I would keep Miller there and then maybe take out Ronnie Williams. But I, I'll be honest, I haven't seen enough. Uh, enough uh, plays on either of them to really make that judgment. Uh, kind of, I, I think we're going to kind of skip over the offensive lineman just because that was a very tough uh, position to, to kind of grade and when with what we've got available. So props to Phil Steele for looking at that for us. Uh, and you could, you can definitely go ahead and, and check out this website if you're interested in those rankings. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to defensive linemen, though, because that is something that uh, not only keeps stats for, but Jordan Lewis dominated this past year. And, of course, deservedly so, Jordan Lewis, the uh, Buck Buchanan Award winner, was on his first team. Uh, the defensive end out of Southern had five games played, 27 total tackles, 15 tackles for loss. That's what really gets me. A forced fumble, 10 and a half of those uh, TFLs were sacks. Um, uh, as far as the other guys that he had on his first time, Isaiah Chambers, Jared Brinkman, DJ Coleman, any, any other guys that you think maybe should have moved up in there? I know we talked about some guys that were on his second team, like Mike Green, Jahari Kay, any of those? 
into the first list? No, I think you got it right because those guys had either played a great amount of games and had uh, consistent numbers in terms of tackles for loss. So you look at the second team, you got a couple of uh, Colonial Athletic Association guys who really didn't play much. But, I mean, we know they can ball in guys like Mike Green and from Richmond, Kobe Turner. So I think you got it right. Um, and especially to having the Buck Buchanan Award winner first team. I mean, you know, no such controversy on defense as we had no, on offense. Not, not at all. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I pretty much agree with this list. Um, I, I was a Mike Green fan throughout the year um, of JMU, but he got on the second team. So it's really hard for me to complain <laughs> about any of that. Um, kind of moving on to the linebacker group. Um, we got some VMI representation, which was the important thing with Stone Snyder, and deservedly so. Anytime you have 88 total tackles, that deserves to be mentioned. Uh, he was averaging 11 of those a game. Um, as far as uh, Colby Campbell, Trey Walker, Bryson Armstrong, any disagreements with those? No, I mean, I don't I don't have any because I think Trey Walker had 54 tackles in four games uh, at a clip of 50 or 16 per game. Excuse me. My division skills failed me. I, I do think this. So one thing that does get me about the linebackers is where's Connor Riddle? Because I know you got Stone Snyder, but Connor Riddle. That's why I mean, that's why that was the first I have been my notes. Connor Riddle, where, where is he on this list? Because I don't think you can have Stone Snyder on the first team and then Connor Riddle not mentioned at all. He had 20 tackles against Citadel and against that option offense. Like, I mean, that, that, that should say something. And yeah, I'd say you can say inflated stats, you know, a middle linebacker playing against a triple option team. But I mean, earlier too, with getting in the backfield as well earlier in the year and his, his tackle for loss numbers, I think they were better than uh, Stone Snyder's. I'm not too sure, but he had nine and a half tackles for loss. And, um, you know, I just, I'm just shocked. I'm just shocked really, especially even too, he didn't even get any votes for Buck Buchanan, but you know, I, I digress. I mean, with most of these linebackers, I totally, I totally agree. I think it's interesting too. You'll see uh, there's some guys that didn't play much in the linebacking core. Titus Leo out of Wagner and Ryan Greenhagen out of Fordham. I think it's cool that uh, Phil Steele accounted for short sample sizes. Uh, yes, those picks aren't really wow, like you know, wow picks, but they're great too. But and also too, I like Story Jackson's pick. Um, Story Jackson had 20 tackles against Texas Southern in the Labor Day Classic played in March. Um, and just an overall ball hawk in three games, 50 tackles and eight and a half tackles for a loss. I mean, if he would have played a full season, I bet that we might have had a swack one and two for the uh, Walt for the Buck Buchanan award. No, definitely. I, I agree with you. And, and like I said, my biggest point, Connor Reddle should have been on there, but um, not taking away anything from the guys that were listed, but definitely would have liked to see him story Jackson. I, I agree with that three games played 50 tackles. It's just an insane number. Um, so props to props to Phil still for putting him on there. Um, and one thing that I forgot to mention on defensive linemen, do you know who led a uh, defensive lineman with like a minimum of like five games played as far as forced fumbles per game in that ratio? Defensive force fumbles. Was it's, it, that, um, it's like a minimum of five games was kind of my criteria. And, and he's on here? His second team on there. Second right team. Was it Mike Green? It was Jahari K. Uh, Mike Green actually didn't have any force fumbles. Oh, okay. Jahari K, nine games played force, four force fumbles. Tongue twister there. So um, I, I just thought that was an impressive stat by, by K uh, for that. Um, moving on to the, uh, to the DBs, um, it was a, uh, it was an impressive list. I, I, I like this. So uh, this is maybe the ones that, that I agree with maybe the most, um, love Cordell Jackson, only one interception this year, which is a lot of times the first number you look to when you look at a DB, but he had nine and a half tackles for loss. Um, don't let uh, NFL meme pages tell you that guys like Jamal Adams aren't good just because they don't pick the ball off. Like the, this was a solid list. Uh, got in the backfield a lot. Also had 54 tackles. So I, I'm going to put uh, Cordell up in the first list, but it's it's hard to disagree with any of these guys. I, I like them a lot. Yeah, I agree. Uh, also, Jackson, I know I couldn't help but notice you skipped the uh, the Southern Utah linebacker that's on uh, on the second team. Um, any chance well, to get you to say his name? <laughs> Akia Ohano Davis. There, 
what what a name on um, yeah. yeah i mean i i would have skipped over two jackson so I, I don't blame you at all but <laughs> thanks <Phil Still>. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah for defensive backs i really like this list too uh i know you're high on a guy uh, i was high on cario harper with just like the body weight that he had over the long season <laughs> excuse me um robert rochelle i know that's a guy you like uh, a senior ball oh. alum um, yeah. didn't have much in the statistical way, but the, the scouts like him. Um, yeah. so I, I agree with that. Uh, for sure. uh, yeah. And then James Caesar. Oh my gosh. James Caesar on the first team. Like it's easy to not really recognize, you know, players for if they don't get much interceptions, but Caesar had 15 pass breakups. I think we had one or two picks absolute ball Hawk for the Salukis. Yeah. And oh, definitely. yeah, like, I mean, I, I was a firm believer of this. I when I played high school ball, you know, when I sc- when I started corner on JV, um, I didn't have good hands, but I can get my hands in the ball and you know move it to the next down without any yardage. So pass breakups matter too. Sorry, Omar. Not all of us are Jalen Ramsey. Good grief. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, guy that I wanted a little fun fact. Um, there is a guy on either the first or second team that didn't play defensive back until college. He was a four-year starter in high school at linebacker and running back. Do you know who it might be? Um, is it – I think I saw it when I was doing my research. I, I might have forgotten who it is. Was it um, – I want to say – I'm going to go with Fernando Jordan. Was it Fernando Jordan? It was not. It was Kendrick Whitehead. So you got the oh, right – right. Man. It was both second team. But I just thought that that's impressive to be a yeah. four – are on both sides of the ball in high school and then move to a completely different position group and end up being on the second team, second uh, All-American team. So that, that was impressive to me. I just wanted to mention that. Uh, props to Kendrick Whitehead. I um I spent probably a little too much time trying to figure out if he was related to Jordan Whitehead because that would make a lot of sense. He is not. So don't <laughs> think that he is related to the, the Buccaneers defensive back. <laughs> um, uh, Omar, I know you uh, – we wouldn't this wouldn't be a podcast if we didn't talk about punters and special teams and <laughs> what did you uh in your deep dive into fcs special teams what what do you find uh well yeah before we go to special teams i do want to i do want to add uh props to yeah. um both uh brandon barbie uh and um kevin gleichen out of san diego in the pioneer league i know it's hard you know to get exposure out of those leagues if you're not san diego or the teams that are beating San Diego, but Gleichen had a great year for the Toreros, had six and a half sacks, a defensive tackle, and I think nine tackles for loss, which is really impressive, honestly. I mean, it's hard to really tack up those stats and tackles at defensive at defensive tackle, especially when he's probably getting double teamed in that scheme as well. Uh, in terms of Barbie for more for Moorhead State, who didn't have who they had an all right year, but ultimately did not uh, win the title, losing to Davidson in a game that would have sent them to the playoffs. Uh, Barbie had a great year on defense. Um, he's not showing up, but he had five picks, five picks in uh, seven games and definitely a good high number. But uh, now going to special teams, my favorite, like there are some absolute dogs on special teams. And I'll start with the punters. Like, I don't, I think all the punters that were chosen for the All-American team could be interchangeable. Um, and I'm sure you'll have something to say about that. Uh, the kickers, I'm going to go with Ethan Ratke. Ethan Ratke is first pick, definitely great. Uh, a guy that's had a great career for James Madison and went a perfect 14 for 14 for the Dukes. And then onto the punter for the first team, Daniel Whalen, 17 punts for a 47.9 all round it, 48 yard average. That's that's an average you don't really get. And you know, maybe he was helped out by the thin altitude in the big sky, but the number is still impressive, altitude or not. Uh and I mean, again, you go to the you go to the second team as well, uh, with Garrett Wegner, a guy out of North Dakota State who's averaging 45 and had a high efficient rate out of 45 punts, 19 down inside the 20. Really efficient because that's that's a really sexy stat, I think, in terms of punts. Uh, pinning, t- pinning teams deep because field position matters and that changes the course of games. And you can say the same thing, too, about Cade Coffey out of punter you in Idaho. Idaho, they had, a, uh, they had a All-American punter, I believe, in, in, in Austin Rico. Uh, that also speaks a lot to their offense in some years, but uh, Austin Rico would go on to play in the AAF and the XFL. Uh, their punter, Cade Coffey, had uh, out of 26 punts, 16 were down to inside the 20, which is an amazing rate. So uh, enough gushing about punters as we usually do on this podcast. Uh, the return men were impressive. Christian Watson with uh, with a 33-yard average on 10 returns and two touchdowns in those 10 returns. 
Um, you know, great return man. Um, Rashid Shahid, same thing, 28 yards return. You go to the punt returners, some really impressive guys. We've talked about Jaquez Ezard. I mean, again, this is why I say that he's a finalist. I think he's, he's a front runner for the Walter Payton. But you go down the line, um, the, the returner I think that probably should have gotten second team, in my opinion, was Tyron Ralph. I, nothing against Gardner Webb's, uh, nothing against Gardner Webb's Devron Harper, but Tyron Ralph had a bigger body work and was arguably more impressive too. He had 14 punt returns for 209 yards and um, one touchdown. He had an average against Mississippi Valley State. He had five returns for 142 yards. And I, I remember that our, our friend of the pod, Trey Lenve, uh, Troy Lenve, he uh, talked about how, you know, his punts had, you know, subdued Tyron Ralph. So, so no easy feat and nothing against Tyron Ralph. Um, but a really a great return, man. And you can say the same thing about Devron Harper, who had a great year for Gardner Webb. It's, I'm sorry if I talked a lot, but that that just got my blood flowing, Jackson. Oh no, we we're, we're <laughs> talking disproportional disproportional amount about uh, about punters and all things special teams, which I love. Um, yeah, I uh, I agree with all that, and uh, yeah, I mean he did a good job. I think he got the special teams right. I think the defensive backs and the special teams are maybe the two things I I agree with the most on this list. Um, Quick, we weren't planning on this. What is uh who maybe not predict a winner? Who do you think are some teams to at least watch out for next season? Um, let's see. Well, before that, can we, can we talk about? Uh, I didn't really go over all purpose. Um, I, I didn't really know that was special oh, yeah. teams, but there were some. There were some absolute Swiss Army knives on the all purpose side, especially the guy I liked a lot, uh, Javon Williams. And you think when you think all purpose, you think right. about kick returns and rushing. He had five hundred thirty-two rushing yards. Uh, didn't really return many kicks. Uh, he had 12 returns for 113 yards, nothing too impressive, but the man threw the ball a lot <laughs> for Southern Illinois. He had over 200 passing yards, when, excuse me, nine of 14 passing and three touchdowns without a pick. Uh, it's like, it feels like 2008 with the Wildcat again. It's like, is this Ronnie Brown or Javon Williams? <laughs> um, Kevin Ward too. Again, that guy, I mean, well, first, I'm sorry, I skipped over Quay Holmes. Quay Holmes, who returned kicks for East Tennessee State and was a workhorse, too. Was all, I think he also got votes for the Walter Payton, had over 600 rushing yards and 300 kick return yards. Great choice there. But we were busy talking about Kevin or Cameron Ward the whole year for um, UIW, Incarnate Ward, but we missed out on Kevin Brown, who averaged over 10 yards a carry, 74 carries, 775 yards. So uh, I missed that, yeah. Yeah, I missed uh, it, too. I didn't I realize there was a – By Kevin Brown. Yeah, Cameron Ward, it's a quarterback's it's a quarterback's game nowadays. So yeah, we'll use that excuse. But to answer your question, I guess favors for next year, you can't go wrong with North Dakota State. <laughs> yeah, that, that you has can't. to be one of one of two or three for sure. Um, they're just a machine. Even when you think they're down, they they seem to always pop back up. It's just like, you know, Alabama and the FBS level. It's like Anytime you think like you remember all those preseason things, I was like, no, Alabama's like actually going to struggle this year because they're missing a bunch of them. No, they'll, they'll figure out a way. So you have to put North Dakota state up there, even if it doesn't make sense. I think at least, I think we could see maybe even two championships in the next three years from South Dakota state. And let me tell you why um, their best players, Isaiah Davis and Mark Ranowski, both freshmen, uh, it's impressive enough that they did what they did uh, this past year, going to the FCS championship, got a loss in as a young team. Uh, they're known as a powerhouse, maybe not always as high as North Dakota State, of course, but they're known for definitely being up there. I think we could see a championship from them, if not next year, in the next couple of years, and maybe even two, because they're a young team, got two great young leaders. I think they're really good. Yeah, uh, and now that would have been my second too because uh, I overlooked the fact that Gronowski. I was just I was thinking about revenge, honestly, just a revenge tour. And this team has been on the big stage now, and they, they I guess they know how it, how it feels, really. Um, so that would have been my second oh, choice. I, I I really think they might win in the next couple of years. We'll see. I'm picking NDSU for this next yeah, year. Yeah, same here. Um, I I think I I mean if there was a dark horse. I would have to say there's dark horse. I think it might come out of the SoCon if I'm being honest, because the SoCon is a it's a great, well-rounded conference, um, and you know it, it, they they play good ball there. There's a plenty of teams that emerge. I mean, Furman had down year. They're usually a power. Chattanooga opted out early. 
Um, I, I mean, I'm not going to go with VMI. I think that team is still a bit green in the postseason. But if I were to pick a sleeper, I, I would think it would be either maybe a Furman or um, maybe even a Chattanooga who opted out early. So I, I, that's where I think my dark horse would come out of. But I, I, I'm with you with one and two, North Dakota State. I think the title will always run through either the uh, Missouri Valley or the CAA. If I'm going to pick a CAA team, I'm, I'm going Delaware. I think Delaware is back. And going into the, the HBCU sector, do you think Dion will be a little more successful in his second year? Or do you think we're going to – how do you think this is going to play out over the next couple of years? So the the SWAC is chock full of great teams, and I think we saw that this spring. I mean, you got Southern looks like they're going to stay for a while. Um, you have Alcorn State. You know, don't forget about the Braves. Don't forget about the Braves. Yeah, I think um, – three time or two time defending celebration bowl champs. Can't forget about the Braves too. Uh, and that soul bowl that they play every single year out there. Uh, and also to Alabama A&M, you know, the defending HBCU national champions. So I think, I, I don't think he, I don't think he's winning the swag. I think he'll have a winning season. I think maybe six and five, or I don't know if they're playing 12 games. I think six and five, seven and four is a very reasonable prediction for them. They have talent, but I mean, there's swag teams with more talent and just more experience, frankly, too. I mean, Grambling, if you want to call them a dark horse after the bad spring they had, I mean, Broderick probably has experience out there at in um in is it southern and northern Louisiana. Yeah, the swag is loaded. Um, and of course we'll love to see a little bit more love to the MEAC than was given this past year, but I, uh, the swag I think we're loving. Uh, as far as the depth that they have, and it always will make for an interesting competition for sure. Um, and then, uh, yeah, well, I think that our last point that we we're going to talk about is was the spring season good for uh, was it a success? Did, oh, I'll, I don't know, you tell me, you you th- you liked it, yeah. So, look, the question that I thought of when I was doing research, too, I'm sure you saw it too, was the amount of guys that. Um, enter the transfer portal from the All-American team. Just to name a few, first team linebacker out of Kennesaw State, Bryson Armstrong, transferred to UCF. Spencer Wagey, or no, not Spencer Wagey, excuse me, John Ridgeway transferred to Arkansas. Uh, we, Colby Campbell, his uh, transfer to Duke was a big one. Uh, and for me... I did not see that Colby Campbell one. That That's going to be something for Duke. Yeah, oh. it, it will be great for sure. Uh, might might help them get to the um, the Birmingham Bowl, but... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm not, not throwing a shot at Duke fans. I just want to make a joke. <laughs> Taking a shot at Duke like that, man. I'm sorry. They, they didn't do anything. But um, I again, I think people are saying, oh, man, we love the spring season. We love the exposure. But coaches, I don't think they're loving it. You know, they're seeing the players get. Oh, poached. no, like, no. I, I, don't I don't think, think it was coaches like it at all. I think from an exposure standpoint, it's great. But coaches don't care at all about exposure. I feel like I feel like they care about how many games they win. You know, yeah. um, that, that's what you're trying to do. That's what you're getting paid to do is go win. And it was nice having more guys see how more people see those, these guys on TV and stuff. But, um, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're an FCS fan, if you're a, a diehard fan of an FCS team or just FCS in general, um, I don't think you like it at all. Like maybe it's a little bit easier to catch a game on, on network TV, but it's not, it's not, it's spring football. So it's spring college football. It just doesn't feel right to these schools. So we'll definitely see it go back to the fall uh, from an exposure standpoint. It is great. Let's, well, let's say like the FCS was serious about pursuing the spring, which they're not. Um, but if they were serious about making, maybe keeping that up, um, any guy who thinks they have half a shot at making it to the league, it's not going to go into that. They're not going to go to the FCS. And if they do, if they do go to the FCS, the minute they realize they have NFL potential, they're going to either opt out of their senior season or transfer to somewhere else. I just think it would be, it would make for much less uh, good play, if that makes sense. So we're not going to see these guys go to the senior bowl or go to the NFL if they, if we did move it to the spring. So I think, you know, moving back to the fall was great for a year. Uh, one year is good for exposure. I don't think it's a permanent solution. So, yeah, and I, I think I think a lot of. I'm oh, sorry, sorry about that, Jackson. 
Oh, no, I was just saying that's my opinion, and okay. we'll, we'll get back to, to the XFL next year. Yeah. <laughs> um, or uh, USFL. <laughs> USFL's yeah, back. Yeah, or the USFL, without, yeah. Without, without Donald Trump to kill it. I don't think Donald Trump will kill the USFL this time. <laughs> small, it's yeah. small potatoes this time. Yeah. Um, can't blame him for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you make a great point in terms of, yes, it's good exposure, but I don't think the fans like it too because I was talking to – um, which I mean, this this uh, episode of the, po- this episode of the podcast is going to drop later on on Sunday. I was talking to an FCS um, talk show host. Uh, his name's Kevin. He was saying that, yeah, if you want to go to a SoCon game, and you know this darn well, being an SEC country, Jackson's like, you want to go to an SEC game, you got to mortgage the home, you got to do a bunch yeah, of stuff. Yeah. But Just you want to, <laughs> yeah, you want to, you want to see, um, you know, you want to see Wofford play or, you know, any SoCon school play. It's, it's not expensive. I mean, you can even, you can even buy concessions if you want to. Um, yes. <laughs> it's like, it's like, that's, that's the thing what separates the FCS apart from the FBS, at least in some regions, um, you know, like the, especially like the South. And I don't think the fans would enjoy that too. And plus, you know, looking at, I mean, having fans sit out in late April in, you know, in late April in Georgia, late April in central Texas, it's not just not a fun time. This is not gonna be a fun time. No, no not at all. Um, it's it's you don't have football weather in the spring. I think for all around. I think from like uh, a very like if you're if you spend like only like thirty seconds thinking about it. Oh, that would be really cool. That seems good. But you actually look at anything like look at all into it. I I don't think it would be a good idea. So, <laughs> but we won't see that happening. Uh, it was fun for a year. Hopefully we never have something like this again that forced it to the spring. Um, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But I, I'm curious to see how the next fall season goes because we're coming off of a short year. Some of these guys are going to play like 20 games in a calendar year. And that is just not, our, you know, at, at that level, the bodies aren't meant for that in general, but like you see that for some guys in the NFL when that's they're getting paid an, an appropriate amount to do that. But these guys that are just doing it on the side with school, like uh, ooh, that is not going to be good. I'm, I'm hoping we don't see an injury prone season for the FCS. I'm hoping we see good competition and um, it's, it's going to be a very important uh, training camp and, and summer installations that you'll see. That's going to be very important because we're going to, we don't want to see guys cut corners and then end up getting hurt in the fall. Uh, that's what I think we're all hoping for. Yeah. Um, really looking forward to getting back to the fall as well. And that's a concern I had. And I definitely think that some conferences that opted for shorter seasons had it right. If I'm being honest. Um, yeah. Not, not yeah. a bad idea. If you're thinking about the long term, that was a smart choice for sure. Yeah. So um, well, hopefully again, like, I mean, prayers out to the players. But, you know, excited to get back to the fall. And what was a great season? Again, uh, the FCS, our FCS coverage isn't going away. It might reduce in magnitude, but that's only because we got to cram stuff into, into our, um, our sack or into our, our you know, ba- our backpack a bit more. Yeah, for sure. I'm looking forward to getting more into the, uh, the college football awards and uh, at the FBS level. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll get to see those be done in Atlanta again at the College Football Hall of Fame. Um, so looking forward to that and uh, no more virtual award ceremonies this year. We can get into these guys. And yeah, I mean, I feel like we didn't uh, dive too deep into any of the college football awards besides the Heisman for this past year. So I'm excited to do that this upcoming fall and uh, going over that. That'll be that'll be a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm excited to see that. Yeah, me too. Um I mean, and I know, I know we're both excited to be covering awards that we can get all the stats in one place as going, as opposed to going to individual school sites. Yeah. That that, that definitely was hard. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was difficult, but Hey, I'm looking forward to it for next year. So yeah. Um, that's, that's it for me. Um, it is still, if you're an NFL fan is the busiest June maybe we've ever had. So that's fun to keep track of, but uh, you got anything else to, to add from that? No, um, I, re- I really don't. Uh, if you want to, F- if you want to, if you want a good, um, good, good betting beat to a good betting line to hop on, I'm not sure if they'll be underdogs when this game comes, comes on, but if they do, uh, I'd take Holy Cross over, over UConn. I want to bet that game. Um, same with Yale and UConn. 
Um, it should be a great year for the Northeast and FCS, especially the, the, the men of the Seven Hills of Worcester. Put a, go ahead and, and put 50 bucks on, uh, on Emory winning the Heisman this year, too. <laughs> so, yeah. You'll, you'll be pretty <laughs> we'll see. Man. We'll see on that one. Yeah, but yeah, we will. September so, 18th. That, that's all I got to say for that, for that Heisman <laughs> campaign. September 18th. <laughs> Uh, that's that's gonna be. I mean, I cannot wait. I've I've told you this before. I can't wait for the CBS contract to end with the SEC because I'm tired of these games like being at three thirty in the afternoon. Like that should that should just not be the case. I mean, that's their slot though. Like twelve o'clock is Fox, three thirty is CBS, seven thirty is ABC. I mean, that's that's yeah. Their but spot. now like eight thirty ABC is going to be the SEC. Like it should be. So I'm tired of not seeing Chris and Kirk call call our games. I'm I'm looking forward to to having it at night. So more night games. Never opposed to that. Yeah, same here. Um, I I don't have anything else, Jackson. Um, yeah, I'm good. All right. So until next time, peace, love, and soul, everyone.